This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. Good evening. Welcome to Libertarian Counterpoint. Uh, I'll be your host, Jason McPhee, and with me today uh, is Tim Everett, a libertarian and pilot from the state of California. And we're going to be talking about some of the issues related assault on liberty that's happening with this coronavirus right now and some updates on that. So as far as that goes, uh, I guess the first thing we wanted to jump into is the quarantine. That seems to be affecting everyone. And one of the issues with that is the issue of uh, authority. Where does this authority come from? It was funny as I was looking this stuff up, it actually looks like in the CDC's uh, website, it, it talks about the Commerce Clause is where they actually draw their authority. Uh, Tim, did you want to talk at all about that at all, uh, or on the quarantine and the way that they're keeping us all locked down at the moment? My reading of that, as I recall, and correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I was under the assumption that was true about the Commerce Clause, but it was in regards to specific quarantines and not a general quarantine, similar to a uh, kind of a general warrant, for example, a, a general warrant to search everyone's premises, not particularly anyone uh, that's uh, suspected of a crime. So I think it's Im Im important and a distinction that I've read elsewhere that if you have someone who during these kinds of times has either been exposed or has been tested positive for a particular, for the whatever the pandemic is, that those are the situations where the Commerce Clause can allow for the uh, quarantining of that particular person. But a general, like a general warrant to just tell everybody you have to stay home is, uh, is I think, the, uh, the part that libertarians are having an issue with. And I don't think that's covered under the Commerce Clause. Am, am I off base here in any way? In other words, does the Commerce Clause, I guess that's the question, does the Commerce Clause give a government authority a general uh, power to tell everyone, the, the ones that are infected, the ones that have been close to people that have been infected, or just anybody who's got absolutely no uh, uh, exposure that, that anybody knows of as yet. Yeah. You know? And that's one of the funny things about this whole thing. I mean, we were discussing uh, quarantining uh, when this uh, on the show uh, about a month or so ago when this whole pandemic thing was just starting to raise its head. And and it was it was odd because what we were thinking of was people just being quarantined who were at risk or sick, not the whole population, <laughs> which which is, uh, you know, seems to it really just went outside the box of what our thinking was at the time. And, uh, but, but it's funny too, you know, every time we, we turn around, it seems when looking at the Commerce Clause, it seems to offer just ever encroaching expanses on liberty. Um, Wickard versus Filburn was one of the decisions that happened back in 1942 that, that greatly expanded the federal government's po uh, powers through the Commerce Clause. And essentially a, a farmer, uh, there was, I guess, a, some kind of a, a wheat quota that was set by the government during the war. And so a farmer decided that, well, he was going to ignore the amounts that he could grow, but he just wasn't going to sell it to anybody. And the decision by the courts at the time was, well, it doesn't matter whether you sell it or not, just you producing it is, is interfering with commerce. And therefore we can tell you what you can and can't make regardless of whether you want to sell it to anybody. Yeah. So this yeah, is that's that's one of the funniest uh, decisions, uh, I guess, funny in a uh, just doesn't make any kind of sense way uh, that I've ever heard of. Uh, yeah, I'm familiar with uh, the history behind that. If I don't uh, let's let's say, let's turn it around a little bit. Let's just say that it, it's meat we're talking about. And so I'm a cattle rancher and I grow beef and I'm not going to sell it to uh, anyone outside my little family. I'm just going to eat all my own beef, right? And just grow it for myself. So therefore, I'm affecting all the other, uh, the, the whole broader economy because I have lowered demand in the, in the broad economy. For, for beef, 
because I create my own. Okay, so uh, if that's the case, and what about vegetarians? Can I? Is it illegal to be a vegetarian? Because that too also lowers the demand for beef products. Uh, so, so where where does it end? You know, <laughs> it's like where do you take? How far do you take the logic? What if I want to buy an iPhone, and uh, what does that do for the for the demand of Android-based phones, uh, or vice versa? You see, so. Yeah. It's, it's absolutely ludicrous. It, it very much feels like letting the camel's nose into the tent and pretty soon the whole camel's in the tent. <laughs> you know, it's, it's pretty much uh, the, the right. way you give the government an inch and, and, and pretty soon uh, you, you've given it the whole ball game. This is one of those issues. I mean, when you look at, uh, I think most people would have assumed that when giving the CDC this power that a quarantine would, would involve just the people who needed to be quarantined, potentially people who could spread the disease, not everybody, which is, it just seems like an extraordinary granting of power uh, above and beyond crushing all of the other freedoms uh, guaranteed in the constitution. Correct. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Because if, uh, if I have a disease and if I want after knowing I have the disease, if I want to continue with my normal life and, and, go out amongst other people, then I will be a potential, I will potentially hurt the freedom of someone else. So from a libertarian standpoint, if a government entity wants to quarantine me to keep me from hurting other people, that makes liber a libertarian sense or sense to a libertarian. And if I don't have the disease and the government just wants to quarantine me just because, because I'm a person, uh, then that infringes upon my freedoms to move around. Now, it, with this particular disease, the little caveat is that it takes up to, what, seven days or some, some length of time before, while you're asymptomatic, before you know if you're hurting or harming someone else by giving them the disease just from talking with them, you know, is that's all it takes, right? Droplets uh, ex exhaled during, during uh, speech or a cough or a sneeze or whatever. And so, okay, <clears throat> instead of locking everybody down, which, which does affect their freedom, how about a little bit of a compromise? And so that brings up the question, would it be prudent or would it be something that would not trample on people's liberties to require that people in public that are talking to people that they don't normally are not associated with, in other words, somebody outside the family or the, the household, would it be prudent to require that they wear masks? Okay, so that's the latest uh, thing. And that's a thing done by South Korea and Taiwan and nations that instead of just telling everybody to stay home, they, uh, they, they researched and researched and, and continually kept the public informed about what best practices were. And certainly best practices have seemed to uh, to indicate that wearing a mask is a good way not to harm someone else. So I think from a libertarian standpoint, you, you know, no, I, I would normally not wear a mask around, you know, outside, you know, talk, you know, like when I'm, let's say if I had to go to the store to purchase some food, I, I normally would not wear a mask, but uh, for the sake of other people, I can see the, the prudence and, and in fact, because I may unknowingly inflict a disease upon someone that, that may be even fatal to that person, yeah. uh, I certainly can wrap my head around wearing a mask for their sake, if not yeah. for mine. Yeah. yeah. And part of that's just being, I guess, a good neighbor, which I guess most libertarians would agree is a pretty good policy. But, you know, you yeah. went into another area there, too, and it's what's the rest of the world doing at this point? And, um, you know, it, it seems like a lot of other countries are going in a similar direction to what we're doing to greater or lesser degrees of 
lockdown. You mentioned a couple of countries there that might be doing a, a little bit on the light side of all this. Uh, I've heard Sweden is also not not being very heavy handed at this point as well. Yeah. But yeah, uh, it, was, it was one of those uh, Nordic uh, countries, uh, probably Sweden. And the, uh, the other one, it was uh, either, I think, Norway or Sweden or back back and forth. They, maybe I'm mixed up. But I think Denmark might have been one of the others. But a Denmark, I think, Denmark. Is, some of these countries, they're, they're, they're starting off. And then as the political pressure builds up, some of them are caving in. I think Denmark is one of those that started off allowing, uh, taking a more lazy, fair approach. And then they've, uh, have, you know, kind of cracked down, I think, a, a little bit lately. Uh, yeah, I've heard about that too. Um, uh, you know, maybe if you had a, a this is my first, uh, uh, this is my excuse time. Uh, this is my first uh, foray into being interviewed on subjects like this. And uh, so uh, maybe I, I would have a little bit better research, but uh, oh, no I, have, I have heard all the same things, what you're re referring to there. and. Um, other indicators say that the of the two countries, the Nordic countries that we're talking about here, there really wasn't any difference in their number of uh, new new uh, patients that that had the disease as a result. So, in other words, um, some countries just you know, okay, everybody stay home, and some kind of, okay, everybody go to work, but wear a mask and social distance and so on and so forth, and the you know the the growth patterns are very very similar so you know that that i think uh is an important factor in our response is uh because our response has been quite uh damaging to the economy yeah. um so uh, you know maybe it was all unnecessary okay but cats out of the bag the economy's damaged and here we are so what are we going to do now at least we're not as bad i just read something again i haven't really verified it but uh the philippines uh, the leader of the philippines has given his military and his uh, police forces uh permission to uh to uh, use deadly force against people that are not uh not uh, obeying the uh, stay-at-home order so uh i guess that's you know uh, a, a case where the government feels to protect you, we're going to shoot you down so that yeah. you don't get that disease or spread it around. Well, you know, this is one of the things too, I think it really lays home the point of, of um, not putting all the power in one body or one central government because the idea is here we see all these competing methods that are going on, people trying different things. Our, our government was actually telling us at the beginning of this crisis, not to wear masks <laughs> and and yeah, as you mentioned, right. uh, the other countries uh they've taken a different approach and they seem to be helping but had we just followed dogma sent down by you know uh, leadership uh then the, you know these are the kind of the problems i guess that you can wind up in it so it really goes to point towards you know the, the you know let let more ideas sprout you know not not just one top-down idea to to manage all problems certainly we wouldn't want the solutions you mentioned in the Philippines, <laughs> the ones that uh, yeah. you know, might wind up here as well. So hopefully well, that's, that's not coming. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's the nice thing about our states, our 50 states, is that we've got, you know, 50 different approaches, you know, potentially at least uh, outside of the federal overall approach. But uh, we've got uh, that experiment going on there so we can see what different approaches do, you know, of course, so many different factors with each state, but at least, um, you know, we can, oh, I scratched my, my nose there. Uh, I don't know if you noticed that, but. Uh, and don't uh, let the, the president of the Philippines see you do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Might be a capital offense now. Yeah, it, it probably is. Yeah. Apparently he's uh, full of himself, but boy, <laughs> we, we sure do. <laughs> this, this is, I have to say, this has really been, um, this whole pandemic has uh, given us all an opportunity to, you know, uh, test our principles, whether they be toward liberty or toward uh, tyranny, uh, certainly is, is bringing out the best or worst 
depending on, I guess, your point of view, uh, in in our uh, approach to the, this whole thing. And it, and it really, I think for libertarians, especially, it's it's a big test. It's just like, okay, you know, how how do I look at this uh, general stay at home order? How do I look at the alternative to, okay, go on out and go do your business, but you got to wear a mask. That's still an order, you know? So you see what I'm saying? It, 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 it tests our, our principles and how we look at things. Yeah. And sadly, we're seeing that the, the tests uh, for most people is extraordinarily toward abandoning liberty and, and uh, just going with whatever the the uh, leaders happen to say at the moment. <laughs> yeah, and, and quite happy, and quite happy to do it, uh, at least temporarily. But of course, you know, eventually the the money runs out, the food runs out, and people have to get back to work. And then that brings up another issue too: is what are the some of the consequences of of this um, government order essentially to 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 step on the economy in order to protect everybody? It's almost like you know. We're going to shoot you to protect you. It's not quite there, but I mean, if they're going to say, "Well, we're going to take away your business and your job," and <laughs> yeah, um, we're going to we're going to make you homeless and penniless. Uh, but <laughs> you know, you're not going to get the disease. Hopefully, at least not until you get out on the street and you have no uh, no place to wash your hands anymore. Um, right? Is the is the uh, the cure worse than the disease? Is is the question where we're starting to ask, and I think people are going to start asking this more and more as time goes on. As right now, it's it's been kind of a forced uh, staycation, you know, stay at home vacation, and uh, people are using. I I'm assuming as again, I I haven't been af- affected in my job uh, per se, but I, I know a lot of other pilots that have been. Uh, and we can we can talk about that a little bit. Um, and I just saw a note passed over that they're going to start disinfecting our airplanes. So they're asking us to bring our personal gear home with us. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, lest it get doused with whatever they're going to douse it with. You know, so your headset and your uh, you know, your, your flight bag and all, all your goodies. Uh, b- but then, uh, you know, uh, I don't know. I, I just sometimes wonder if this is a fool's errand, but well, yeah, you know, some of the, some of the things well, going on. Well, you know, I was wondering if some of this is, is some degree of say security theater, kind of like with the TSA and nail clippers. Um, yeah. you know, it's, it's, we're being told to stay at home and yet we're kind of getting messages that, you know, well, you know, try and patronize some of your local businesses to keep them afloat, you know, things like restaurants and such. Um, you mentioned disinfecting an airplane. I, I went to Costco a few weeks ago and the uh, and I noticed they were disinfecting all of the carts out in the, the lot, you know, which, you know, maybe it's a good thing. I, I'm not sure. Oh, yeah. I just- have people experimenting with different uh, things but then i go to a fast food place and you see the person take your you know they're wearing gloves but they're taking your credit card and or whatever other form of payment from you and then they're handling your food they're not changing their gloves oh, yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know it, it's, i'm not saying whether or not we should be overreacting one way or the other to it but it's just clearly that doesn't really do anything to keep from spreading anything if you're just wearing the same gloves <laughs> right yeah so, security theater maybe. <laughs> right yeah I, I'm sure a lot of this uh, a lot of this is um, I you know I don't know what the answer is but uh, I do know that the the things that have been done so far you were mentioning the, the graph of, of the, well the, in fact let me let me pull up that graph real yeah, quick yeah let, let's uh, ch- check out some of our yeah. issues that we're having here with unemployment yeah, yeah. So bear with me for just a second here. So can you see the graph now, Tim? Uh, yep, there it is. Okay. So it is held uh, by the public. Exactly. Yeah. And so this is a, just a real briefly, we kind of went over this a few weeks ago on the show, uh, but we didn't, we weren't able to pull it up uh, digitally. So now we have it digitally, but this is essentially debt to GDP. So this, this tells us roughly 
you know, uh, what uh, percentage of, of uh, our debt or is, is to GDP. And you can see historically it's pretty low, but there's always a spike whenever we have some huge challenge like a war. So, you know, at the beginning in our country was new, we had just fought a revolutionary war. Then we hit the civil war. You could see that, you know, in between those periods, we're barely spending anything as a country. We're barely taking on any debt relative to the amount of productivity. But then once you hit World War I and the the New Deal and, and World War II, we get to these really big levels. Well, now, you know, we never really came back, you know, to those low levels of, of debt to right. our productivity. And now as we get, uh, we should be, this is a graph from the Congressional Budget Office from 2019. And so that's where this little line is here. And I, you probably see my pointer there. And yep. uh, that's, where they expected us to be. But based upon the trillions we've been spending and the reduction of GDP, we're actually way up here when, uh, and, and those are actually at levels that are surpassing our World War II uh, levels of debt to GDP. And we really don't have much to show for it. And that was going into the virus. So, you know, it's, it's really alarming. And, and then of course, we talk about other consequences the jobs loss. And, uh, you know, here is a 50 year chart on essentially unemployment claims. Um, and you can see for about 50 years, it's relatively stable under a million per week. And suddenly this last uh, two weeks, this is about a week old, this chart, which is even more alarming because a week old chart, we saw it, we see the graph spike up here near the end, uh, over 3 million claims about two weeks ago. They just added another six something million. So we're at 10 million now. So the consequences of this are, are just absolutely, um, just absolutely extraordinary. And um, you're going to have to get a new graph, uh, Jason. That's uh, the that yeah. uh, way. Uh, I don't know how you're going to contain that vertical line. It's, uh, <laughs> it's how, uh, I imagined it in my mind and it went, out the top of my computer screen. So well, uh, maybe, maybe it's full employment for graph makers. <laughs> I guess yeah, about yeah. The damage that's occurring. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it well, just it, goes to show. Yeah. Well, I mean, so some of the consequences, these are real consequences. And when people say, you know, anything to, you know, save a life, you know, we really have to struggle with that in public policy because you can't simply throw everything out the window, uh, you know, over. Uh, saving a few lives, you ha you have to put a price on these things and decide what the right amount is, and um, right, yeah. testing those ideas right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we are testing, and uh, uh, just a, a little bit of an aside. The, uh, for example, because the passenger uh, part of aviation has been uh, severely uh, impacted by this, and so very very uh, uh, sub a very substantially high amount of airplanes are not flying they're they're parked they're parked on our ramp they're parked all over the airport because no one's flying and inside the bellies of those planes on a normal basis are cargo uh, so now the freight only people uh, such as myself uh, the FedEx UPS side of of uh, of freight have been uh, gladly taking up the slack. So, uh, for example, more planes are being taken out of storage and sent to the Asian countries to pick stuff up that normally would have been coming back on a uh, on an American Airlines or United or somebody else, and uh, Today they're they're being uh, put onto uh, FedEx, UPS planes and brought back here, uh, for for the way it is now. So we've been busier in in uh, as a response to this uh, pandemic, and um, but who knows how long that's going to go on? Because eventually people have to produce. They have to produce, and and people that are normally consuming have to do whatever it is they do in the economy, the whole division of labor. They have to do their thing to improve the lives of everyone and they get compensated. 
and then they're able to purchase things and and so the whole thing works but when everybody's just sticking around at at home thinking i guess this is the new normal i guess we don't have to work we can just sit here and the government will print money and add to the debt like in that first chart and uh, we can just sit around and do nothing isn't life grand well no because <laughs> your whole standard of living depends on everybody all over the world working and currently there's a lot of people not working when that brings up two issues of uh, essential and non-essential goods I, i've got my essential goods right here yeah. <laughs> industrial size roll of toilet paper oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. Where'd, so, so, yeah, yeah. Where'd you get that? I wanna, I wanna make you. Uh, well, we I'm, we actually got a few of those from uh, one of the club stores before they, you know, it wouldn't have ever occurred to buy that size. But yeah, yeah. just the point though of of what is becoming essential and non-essential, and that is to make light of everybody's craze over toilet paper. And uh, but you know, the the idea that government is now telling us which businesses and which items are essential and non-essential, and that seems Right. Pretty extraordinary as, as well. As if they know, as if they can tell. Yeah, as yeah. if it's not a very you know subjective thing. Uh, so um, yeah, I, uh, I for example, uh, uh, barbers are going to be uh, pretty pretty essential here pretty soon, unless we want to cut our own hair. I guess we could you know cut each other's hair or something if you if you had a significant other living with you. But uh, yeah. Uh, so, well, but you know, it's, it's funny too because you look at something like this, and you know, there's there's a cardboard circle in here. Well, is the cardboard maker essential or not? I mean, clearly, if we're going to say toilet paper is essential, oh, then yeah. well, I guess the cardboard maker is essential too, and uh, whatever other you know companies are involved in the process of of creating and making this stuff is going to wind up also facing these questions by central planners. But I think yeah. we're just about running out of time. Uh, did you oh, have okay. any last? Tim, you wanted to share on the crisis? No, just just that I, I think that people uh, instinctively know what to do, what's what's best, uh, and that uh, people will come together in in a normal situation. Uh, that would be a, a situation without government interfering. So, you know, because I part of being a libertarian is you think that man is essentially good, at least, you know, the common man, I don't know about these politicians, but they may be a separate breed. But uh, yeah, so um, I, I guess uh, just uh, continue on and doing the best we can to not expose anyone else and, and we'll eventually get through it. Now, how the economy is, is going to be impacted, that's another story. So maybe that'll be the next time. Sure. Well, thanks for your bird's eye uh, perspective today, Tim. And we'll look forward to having hopefully more discussions on Libertarian Counterpoint. This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. We invite you to come again next week for the Libertarian Counterpoint.